Hi everyone, and welcome again to the June HoloLens and Mixed Reality Meetup. I'm April, a Senior Cloud Advocate with the Spatial Computing Technical Team here at Microsoft. Today, we're going to look at ways in which educators are integrating educational experiences in extended reality, and in my case, mixed reality. I've been working on a world monument exploration prototype in which I've named Monumental World Tour. We'll dig into that in a bit, but for now, I'll give you the rundown of who I am and how I became interested in this space. Here I am, just last summer, shortly after receiving my HoloLens device. I'm still pretty new to this space as I only began to self-teach myself extended reality principles almost a year ago. However, I'm no stranger to tech. In a former life, I was a menswear stylist and visual merchandiser in the luxury fashion industry for brands such as Neiman Marcus and Saks Fifth Avenue. I started out in tech as a project manager consolidating business processes into third-party tools and leading software implementations. In my spare time, I began to learn Python and fell in love with AI voice assistants and chatbots. As much as I love working with Python, I fell in love more with teaching others. I began creating beginner technical instructional content on YouTube, which led to a book deal with Wiley. Up until that point, I figured my life in tech had halted with teaching Python. However, July 2019 proved me wrong. While sitting in the terminal at LaGuardia waiting to board a delayed flight, I decided to take a scroll through Twitter. Those five minutes of reading my timeline resulted in a long series of events, which has led me here to present to you all today. It was the first time I had ever seen a HoloLens device display language translation from one language to another in real time. As a former linguistics major, the language lover inside me was amazed. That weekend, I gathered all the resources I could find to learn more about extended reality as I felt that this was the next tech space for me. Fast forward to January of this year, I attended my very first hackathon, MIT Reality Hack. Here I am at my computer looking for a VR scene for our team's project. Now, if you're not familiar with MIT Reality Hack, it's a five day with only three days to hack event held annually at MIT. I didn't know these guys when I arrived and likewise, no one knew each other. During team formation, we naturally bonded over wanting to break down communication barriers between people through a tool that used the strength of virtual reality. The result was a VR dyslexia and dysgraphia therapy app for children in which we named Spellbound. The experience itself was designed to help children with dyslexia and dysgraphia learn letter formation and word recognition. An animated wizard guides the user through the process of writing letters with a wand to complete magic words and then requests the users to read the word out loud to cast a spell. The app was intended to be used only under the supervision of a qualified professional, such as an occupational therapist or a special education teacher. Our reasoning in doing so was that such professionals use play activities for instruction and therapy. We wanted to extend that methodology into an immersive measurable learning tool. So we also built a dashboard connected to the app, which collected performance from gameplay and provided an assessment of the child's development and improving their reading and writing skills. The idea was that the child's instructor or reading slash speech therapist would use this information to identify areas of improvement and determine the next course of action for instruction. Out of 75 teams, we were winners in two categories. We won best of learning, education and research, as well as best of health and wellness and medical. That experience really opened my eyes to just how much we could use XR to create educational experiences. Since joining the cloud advocacy team here at Microsoft, I found myself leaning mostly to creating educational experiences, not just with the HoloLens, but with tools such as Adobe Arrow and for devices such as Oculus Quest. Next here, I have a clip from one of our testing reviews of Spellbound during the hackathon. It was after midnight and we had spent all evening resolving a huge unexpected bug, as one does during a hackathon. You ready? Yeah. And, oh! And I trace, and I trace. Did I do a good job? I you did! Passed. Oh, I'm gonna trace again. Oh, did I do a good job that time? 
I getting did. smaller. I'm getting smaller now. Now, there's a world of opportunity when it comes to just how much we can leverage extended reality to create educational experiences. I like to share with you two experiences I'm personally fond of. First up is Kai XR. My friend Kai, creator of Kai XR, created a platform where children can explore virtual reality field trips and improve their tech skills by creating their very own VR adventures. What I like most about Kai's VR field trips is that it's built on an inclusive and accessible WebXR platform. You can view the experiences on any device or headset. Not to mention, VR field trips in general can help educators take their class to places around the world without leaving the classroom. Let's take a look at a clip from the A Trip to Paris field trip. The second example I'll show you before heading into Monumental World Tour is the Smithsonian 3D Digitization Project. Although I currently live in Beverly Hills, California, I wasn't always a Californian. In fact, I relocated to California from Washington, D.C. just two years ago. As you may have guessed, my childhood was filled with museum visits to many of the Smithsonian museums. I would even spend my summers as an adult roaming the museum halls looking at all of the artifacts, primarily because I just really love history. Now, rather than book a flight to DC to check out some of the artifacts on display, you can head over to Smithsonian 3D to view 3D models of artifacts available on display at the various Smithsonian museums. What you're seeing here on the screen are the costume booths for the wizard in The Wiz on Broadway, worn by Carl Hall in 1977. On the Smithsonian 3D site, a description alongside object metadata such as classification, collection, and place use is provided. These particular booths are on display at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. On the Smithsonian 3D site, you can rotate and zoom in to view a closer look at the 3D models. Furthermore, you can also download OBJ, GLTF, and GLB models of the objects for use in your own projects. Now that's super generous of the Smithsonian. So let's actually take a look at this experience provided by the Smithsonian. I can use my mouse to click and drag and view the boots from virtually all angles. I can even look at the bottom and I can see here that Wiz was written at the bottom of these boots, for example. If I bring them back up, Let's turn them around and let's check out some of the detail. I can zoom in here and just look at that detail from how the boots have been worn out through the performances and just how time has treated this. Look at this detail in the creases and just how the zipper pulls have been worn out as well. Let me zoom out here, try to show you some more detail. Honestly, this is a better experience from a viewing perspective than if I were to take a look at this in real life, because on display, I don't have that flexibility to pick up the object, take a look at everything from different angles and such. But here at home, not even in the museum, I can actually take 
a closer look at the object. And that is pretty awesome. Here's a first look at Monumental World Tour. In front of me, I have instructions for how the experience work, followed by a dock panel of five monuments. Then to the right, I have a panel of buttons. Upon press, they will provide facts about the monuments. I'll start by using the Eiffel Tower. You can grab the object from the dock. It will expand the size of it, and you can place it anywhere in your environment. I will place it here. And I can take a step back and take a look at that monument. I can also walk around it and check it out from different angles. I have the ability to scale it either smaller or larger, and I can also rotate it. Now, for the button panel that's over here, if I were to press Eiffel Tower, I would have a panel that displays with information about the Eiffel Tower itself. Now, once I'm done taking a look at that, I can grab the model itself and place back onto this dock panel. Notice that the objects slide down to make space for the object, as you can place the object at any of the docking positions. I'm going to take a look now at the Egyptian pyramids. I can grab that off of the dock and place that down here. And if I take a step back, it's pretty large, as you can see. I have some panels blocking my view. And heading back over here to the description, I can click on Egyptian pyramid now and I can see information about the Egyptian pyramid. So once I'm done, I can grab this object and place it back onto the dot. Let's plop it here. So let's take a look at how I created Monumental World Tour. Now, I personally love, love, love low and no code projects as they help lower the barrier to entry for getting started with creating apps and experiences. I am a huge fan of working with the Mixed Reality Toolkit for that very reason. MRTK comes equipped with a handful of scripts and prefabs that are ready to be used in your own projects. Now, this has not only just saved me plenty of time, but has also saved plenty of headache when navigating the differences between Python versus C Sharp, since, as you may recall, Python is my first language. With MRTK, I can usually avoid having to open up Visual Studio and start coding away, which is pretty awesome since there's plenty of scripts available that can help me achieve whatever it is I want to do for my experience. With all that said, I leveraged many of the UX building blocks available within the Mixed Reality Toolkit. But before I dive into the scripts I used, let's talk about these models. I personally shift between the Unity Asset Store, Sketchfab, and Adobe Stock to find 3D models that fit with the experience I'm creating. Previously, I created a solar system experience with Adobe Arrow in which I found free solar system assets via the Adobe stock website. And that was awesome. And if I'm not mistaken, I had also seen some available through NASA as well. In general, you should definitely do a search around on the internet for assets if you are creating experience, especially if you want to avoid creating them on your own. Now this time around, I found Monuments Low Poly Pack by Interactive Project in the Unity Asset Store. You can honestly find some pretty good 3D models for free. So definitely be sure that you're on the lookout for all sorts of models from various sources as you're creating these experiences. Now, since I wanted to provide visual guidance for the user to understand whether they could interact with an object, I decided to make use of the bounding box script from the MRTK. Now the bounding box script adds what appears to be a holographic box around an object. And as you can see here on the screen, I have one that's surrounding the Eiffel Tower. Now I decided to style mine in a HoloLens 2 style, which you can see here with the blue wireframes that's around the Eiffel Tower. Now what's great about bounding boxes is that it provides a visual indicator to the user that they can interact with an object. Now I could have 
placed the objects on the dock with no boxes, but then it wouldn't have been as clear to the user that they could actually touch that object or grab that object as well. What I also like about founding boxes is that there are so many different modifications you can make from a design and style perspective to really help emphasize that ability to do various types of interactions. You can change the handles, for example. You can also use prefabs like what I did for the handles to have more of that HoloLens 2 style, which is what you can see on the picture on the right for the Greek temple. But we'll get to the Greek temple image in a second. Focusing on the bounding box here, one other thing that I added to the monuments was manipulation audio. So with MRTK, there are sounds available for use and you can use them for when manipulations start as well as when they end. So for my monument, I added an event that plays an audio sound to let the user know that they've picked up a object as well as when they released the object. So overall, we have a significant amount of indicators that an interaction of some sort is happening. Next, we have hand interactions. And this is going to be probably one of the more important areas I wanna cover here with regards to the monuments. Primarily reason being that the object manipulator script played a crucial role in enabling the user to actually just even interact with the objects. This script will enable you to enable either one hand, two hand, or a combination of the two interactions with objects. In addition, I also added a near interaction grabbable script to the monuments as well. This particular script allows near interactions. So as you can see here in this image of the Greek temple, my articulated hand is very close to this object. And because I have the near interaction grabbable script, I can actually move it and interact with it. So that's pretty cool as well. Next, we have the doc. So doc is a new experimental UX building block from MRTK. The moment I laid my eyes on this in the release notes, I just knew that I had to try it out. And it's honestly what inspired me to create Monumental World Tour because I really wanted to give it a try. I thought to myself, how cool would it be to treat little objects as toys or objects on a bookshelf and be able to pull them out and do things with it. So thus was born Monumental World Tour. Now to use Doc, you'll need to do a bit of configuration on both the Doc itself and the objects that can be docked. And this is all done with three scripts. The first script is dot. What I first did was create an empty game object in which I named docked that has the doc script added as a component. In addition, I also added the grid object collection script to the dock object so that I could organize my monuments into an evenly spaced row of five. Grid object collection is a script that's available with the mixed reality toolkit. And as it named indicate, it enables you to organize objects into a grid. And there's a variety of ways you can style this grid. I chose to use this version here of five objects in an evenly spaced row. Next, I created dock position objects as children of the dock object, which are used as the place where the monument will dock. I then added a dock position script to each of these child dock position objects. And as you can see here on the screen, the placement for the docks are these circular objects, which happen to also be prefabs that's available with Mixed Reality Toolkit. So, so far, I haven't had to create anything from scratch. All of this was available within the Mixed Reality Toolkit. As for the final script, dockable, what I did was add this script to each monument object to indicate that the object could be docked. So what's going to happen, as you've seen in the demo as well, is that any object in my scene that has this dockable script 
has the ability to be docked on that dock game object that I first created. And as I remove objects from dock, they expand to a larger size. And when I go to place them back, they get smaller again. And if I, must, if I want to insert that object at a dock position where an object is already placed, it'll move that object down and make room for it at that dock position. So I like that there's that flexibility there with deciding where objects get docked. Now the last piece of this project are the monument facts. Starting with the scene panel, I chose to repurpose the scene panel, which can be found within the MRTK examples package. I gathered my own facts from Wikipedia and placed them onto the text component of each of the panel objects. Rather than reinvent the wheel and create my own slate and add my own text and move placement here and there, I figured it made more sense to use what was already created. So that's why I use the scene panels from the MRTK examples. As for the facts, I summarized what I found on Wikipedia, but I essentially could have went anywhere to grab this information off the internet, assuming that it was credible, of course. Next, I needed a way to get these facts to display in the experience. I didn't want them to always be visible. Rather, I wanted the user to toggle them on in some sort of format. So before I even got to the toggling aspect, I needed something for the user to interact with to even do the toggle. Fortunately, with MRTK, there are button prefabs available that the user can press and you can configure to perform some sort of action. Now, with the button prefabs with MRTK, there are a variety of styles available and you can also create your own custom buttons. I decided to go with one of the prefabs and I chose to use the 5H button. This particular prefab is a panel of buttons and it happens to have five that are horizontal, hence the 5H. There wasn't much that I needed to do with this particular prefab because there were already a variety of scripts and components added to the prefab itself. What I did need to do, however, was change the default labels as well as the icon because I wanted something different. Fortunately, there is a button config helper component that exists with the button prefabs. This particular component enables you to modify how the button is styled. And what I really liked most about this is that I didn't have to go on the internet and search for icons to use on the buttons. There were already icons available with MRTK and through the button config helper, I was able to swap them out. In addition, I also added some MRTK audio here as well, because I wanted to provide a way for the user to hear when they were pressing a button. So that way they would be aware of the fact that they in fact successfully pressed the button. As for the toggle aspect that I mentioned a moment ago, I made use of the toggle object script, which also comes available with MRTK. And I applied these to each of the facts panels that I use for each of the monuments. And I created a button release events to be toggled that would toggle the fact panels to be active or high, depending on whether the respective button for the monument was pressed. And as you can see here, those were added to the button released events. Throughout this talk, I've shared a variety of resources and have gathered them all here for you to explore further as you begin to create your own educational experiences. First up, we have the Mixed Reality Toolkit. This link here on the side will take you to the GitHub repo for MRTK, as well as the documentation. That link is going to be aka.ms slash Mixed Reality Toolkit. Next, we have the Mixed Reality Academy. If you're interested in trying out the tutorials that we've created for you all here at Microsoft, check out aka.ms slash mracademy. There are tutorials available on there for HoloLens first generation, as well as HoloLens 2. There are also tutorials available that will help you get up and running with using Mixed Reality in Azure. 
The next three links that I have here are places on the internet where you can find 3D models. The first is the Unity Asset Store, and you can visit assetstore.unity.com to view the assets on that website. Next, we have Sketchfab. You can view the assets there by going to sketchfab.com. And then finally, we have Adobe Stock. You can search for 3D models there by going to stock.adobe.com. Next, I have a bit.ly link here for Spellbound. Now, one thing I didn't mention to you all earlier is that we have an entire page in DevPost dedicated to our project. If you're curious to learn more about our thought process around how we designed and created the project, feel free to check out the dev post for Spellbound. Also, we have a link to a GitHub repo there as well. So if you're interested in checking out the project itself on your own devices, feel free to check out the repo so you can get up and running and test it out for yourself. And you're more than welcome to modify and make adjustments and use in whatever experience that you're creating. And finally, I have links to different experiences, two in which I've shared during this talk and one in which I thought would be pretty great for you to try out as well. The first is going to be KaiXR, and you can visit her site by going to KaiXR.com. Next, we have Unimersive. Unimersive provides VR experiences ranging from walking with dinosaurs, to learning about human anatomy, as well as exploring the Titanic. So check them out at unimersive.com. And finally, there's the Smithsonian 3D website. You can check them out by going to 3d.si.edu. Thanks for taking a look at Monumental Tour. I'll often share what I'm working on with the tech community over on Twitter. So feel free to connect with me there at Vogue and Code.